Oh, yeah. You do have to ask the And then I heard Phil was yeah. doing this wonderful thing down the West Branch. I asked him if we could piggyback. I said, is there a time we could have Dr. Melvin come and see us? And the only time we pray, about 11 to 2. So here we are. And uh, Phil is uh, a chairman. He's the chairman of the committee in West Bank. The, the Bigfoot Conference, Bigfoot Conference Committee, West Branch Bigfoot Conference Committee. Okay, okay, okay. But I have to tell you, Phil was the first person into the museum to tell us about Bigfoot. His eyes were as big as saucers. He saw it somewhere up in Nova Scotia, no, New Brunswick. New Brunswick. Okay, a bleeding glint. Enough to persuade me that there was Well, a my wife and I uh, saw an a the animal. I was driving. Uh, she was, had a better look. She said it had a funny, funny gait, but you really couldn't tell any differentiation in, in the clothes. And uh, it, was, it was along the superhighway. Mm. But then uh, we got home and we told our three sons that we'd seen Bigfoot. And they said, you agreed on something? <laughs> you must have seen Bigfoot. <laughs> <laughs> so we've been friends really ever since. Uh, Bill has come to the Bigfoot Bar and give a little talk. But you've really got a thing going in West Branch with the group. And that's fantastic. And I wish you the best tomorrow. Thank you. I have to begin eye surgery here, get ready for eye surgery too, so I can't join down there. But the seeing is believe me, you know, nevertheless. Uh, we thank you all for coming. Uh, Bob Daigle is somewhere in our midst. Bob Daigle is one who has helped us every time. Lauren Capel, right there. Uh, John and Kim Fleming, who are here from Carver City, and uh, the group from West Branch, and who else, and who, am I missing anyone? The others who have come to the museum, many of you have been to the Bigfoot Bash at the museum. We do thank you for coming. And uh, so, as they say, without further ado, first, uh, here's our honored guest. Uh, <laughs> I am going to let Phil Shaw introduce Dr. Jeff Milker. I mean, this is probably the most famous person we've had in coming. And I think this is a round of applause. musician we just got off our cruise ship here a little while ago and uh, home for a little bit there and then uh, <clears throat> we have Michelle Twinkler that works with the Road Commission she's turned out to be our uh, real tech person too doing the PowerPoint uh, she helped me with the presentation I'll have tomorrow and John Young <clears throat> uh, he's, he sets a that table in the alley I don't know if any of you have been to the restaurant Max Place down down by West Branch but you know, there's, every town has those table of knowledge. Well, he happened to be at the table and agreed to be on this committee. And he has a good open, both those have real good open minds. And where, whereas uh, Brett here, he's had footprints and he has vocalizations on his property. So he's a little, a little closer to it. But I miss any other committee? I think that's all that's here. We do have two of uh, uh, Amanda, Bruce, uh, Randy that aren't here. <clears throat> but Dr. Melvin is uh, from what? Uh, Po Pocatello, I don't know. I thought it was a suburb of Bo uh, Boise, but he, he stayed overnight with us. And turns out, if you look at the map, Pocatello is way across the state. Yeah. <laughs> it's not a not 280 a, miles away. It, in fact, it's 50,000 people. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, as you know, he, he wrote the book Sasquatch Legend Meets Science. He said in his bio quite a while, a while ago, and it's about a quarter inch thick. CV, not the bio. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, the bio is that thing. But I printed it off. Oh, well, that, well my, my, my resume. My resume, yeah, yeah. yeah my he's, just, he's been all over, all over the world. And there's a tremendous background. So uh, I don't think we really need to introduce him more than that. He's, he's been all over. So okay. Thanks for coming. You bet. My pleasure. Well, it really is a delight. I haven't been to this part of the country before, so it was fun, especially fun to have a, a 
fly over, uh, courtesy of Phil, and so uh, I get to see from the bird's eye view some of the terrain and what the forests are like and the mountains around here. But, uh, beautiful country, really nice. So, given the circumstances, the setting and all, I don't have a PowerPoint presentation, a canned presentation to give to you, so the idea was just to open it up immediately to uh, a conversation, to a dialogue, to a question and answer, um, and so feel any topic that, that you are, uh, have a burning interest in, or? Yeah, I've got a couple please. of questions right off. Uh, okay. Could you comment please on two different things, first the Patterson-Gimlin film, yes. and then also the time uh, you spent on Northern Ontario at a cabin when you had some rocks thrown at the cabin and things like that, so two whole questions. Yes. Well, the Patterson-Gimlin film, I sometimes compared it to the Energizer Bunny, it just keeps going and going right. and going. And what's interesting is there seems to be sort of a perennial cycle of, of assail, uh, attempts to assail it with, with, from some quarter, whether it's Bob Hieronymus making claims, silly claims, or, or uh, you know, British public uh, producer like Chris, Chris Packham claiming that it's obviously a man in a fur suit and so on. Uh, and each time, what's interesting, each time that happens, it seems that there's some new technology available. So, for example, uh, at one point, John Green commissioned Rick Knoll to, um, to create a, a, an archive of digital images of each of the frames. So he set up a really nice microscopic apparatus with a, a real high-end digital camera, photographed it through, uh, through that device at as high resolution as the grain of the film would, uh, would tolerate. In doing that, he was then able to take those digital images and through the computer split the color channels. Now the advantage of that, excuse me, that so does repeating it. <clears throat> that the, the advantage of that is that it was known that, that the camera that Patterson used had a, you know, a, a modest lens that wasn't corrected for chromatic aberration, which means as light comes through, the different wavelengths refract differentially. So some colors will be in sharp focus, some will be slightly out of focus because they, they fall either in front of, they, into focus in front of or in, uh, behind the film plaque. So by digitally then subtracting, splitting and then subtracting the information that's out of focus, you lose a little color information, but the clarity of the image is greatly enhanced because you get rid of all that hazy, out of focus uh, noise. And then um, M.K. Davis took, the, took a CD that had that archive and he strung them together and stabilized them using software to stabilize the image and uh, created a GIF that played at the proper film speed. So you got an impression of the, of the film that's really quite amazing uh, and a clarity that you've never seen. I, I always am frustrated when you have people, and sometimes people who should know better, uh, like Dave Daglin, complaining that the film's worthless, it's blurry, it's shaky, you can't see any detail, you can't see any facial features. Well, he's going off of copies that are very, of very poor quality. Most of the, of the uh, broadcast uh, images that you see on television come from the licensed VHS copy that Mrs. Patterson provides to the producers. And it's a copy of a copy of it. It's like a third generation copy on VHS, which is very low quality medium anyway to begin with. So most people have never really seen the, the, uh, the full impact of that, of that film. Now, recently I've been collaborating with Bill Munns. You may know Bill Munns from the famous picture of the big uh, Gigantopithecus mannequin with the arm up in the air and the gentleman standing next to it is the artist. Bill, Bill was in Hollywood uh, makeup industry for many, many years. He's also a very accomplished uh, anthropological artist and he does, he does forensic reconstructions of, of uh, fossil hominids and living hom hominoids in general. And uh, so he's very versed in the techniques of recreating forensically the appearance of, a, of facial features from the underlying skeletal matter. He also, because of the uh, shift away from makeup artistry in, in, in Hollywood to digital imagery, he's become quite versed in, in uh, computer graphics and, and photogrammetric techniques. So one of the projects, uh, or, or what he had, he, he'd been doing some work 
on, on the film, and you may have seen online, he has the MUNS report with uh, various PDFs posted of some of the, uh, some of the conclusions that he had drawn from his, his viewing of the film, all pointing towards a very positive conclusion. I asked him, uh, when I launched the Relic Hominoid Inquiry, an online academic journal that I now edit, uh, I asked him to write up some of his reports in a format, in an academic style format, so we could get them reviewed and published. And he said, well, I, I'd love to, but I, I hate to publish something that's not finished. I still need to do this, and I should really do this and this, X, Y, and Z, but I just don't have the funding for it. I had coincidentally just been approached by a private uh, foundation, an owner of a foundation that uh, had a charitable account, and he wanted to finance some of my research and ask what would I like to do. And so I thought, ah, okay, put this, put these two together. So, uh, so I kind of twisted Bill's arm to let me in on it as well. If I if I made it rain for him, and he was delighted. To, we had a great working relationship together and have very complementary expertise. So he's been, uh, he took a basically a threefold approach. One was to, in, in, through his photogrammetric analysis, from the film itself, from the primary film, he was able to recreate the scene of the site um, using two dimensional landmarks as seen from varying perspectives as Roger ran across the creek and he changed position. And so you could create, you could triangulate and create a three dimensional model from the film itself. Then he went to the film site. We arranged for him to link up with, um, I just went blank. Um, the gentleman, there's a gentleman who runs the Bigfoot bookstore down there in Willow Creek. Steve. Steve, yeah. yes. Steve, and then there's another fellow, and I, 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 this has been out of touch for a little bit. There's another fellow who works for the Forest Service. There's a whole, there's a little uh, cluster of people down there. Letterman. Who, who have really worked hard at at identifying the site, and they've already done a lot of preliminary survey work yep. and identified the stumps and tree trunks and so forth and nailed down where, it, where it's located. The site changed obviously tremendously. The creek bed has changed position. Sandbar is pretty much gone. The creek is on the other side of the, of the valley now. <coughs> and, and what is there is overgrown with alders. It's tremendously difficult to, it's, it's not a nice open panorama like it, it was in 1967 following a couple of very severe floods that scoured out that canyon. But in, in recreating, or in, in uh, comparing the recreation to the actual on-site survey, the, there was a disparity, especially out at the margins of the field of, the, of view in the frame, which meant that the camera lens was creating distortion. It was a fisheye effect because it turns out Roger was using the panoramic accessory lens that came with that model of camera because he was taking scenery shots. And so he wanted a wider angle. And the degree of distortion then pretty much nailed down what the focal length of the lens was. And there was only, you know, that, that, that camera only comes with certain accessory lenses. And there was a panoramic lens of, I can't remember now what the focal length was. But that was interesting because there is a, a, a very simple proportionality. If you know the height of the subject on the film frame itself, and you know the focal length, and you know the distance to the subject, then you can just solve for x, which is the actual height of the subject itself. And in doing that, the, the subject was clearly in excess of seven feet high. No ifs, ands, or buts anymore. Mm -hmm. And so he's nailing that down, the actual methodology and the, and the logic, uh, the rationale for that. So you can't simply say, Oh, it's just a man in a fur suit. It would have to be just a seven foot <coughs> in a fur suit, you know, seven foot two or three inches, actually. Um, so the, the film site, and then of course his expertise in costume design and fabrication, and demonstrating what was what was available, what materials were available in 1967. They didn't have four-way stretch fur. It was fur cloth, which is like it's just furry material. It has no giver. When you put it on, it's like for it just loads the costume in the back. That's fur cloth, right? You know, and so uh, there's no conforming to the body. There's no there's no way for it to wrap around a foam rubber sculpted muscle <coughs> bicep or something. Of course, at that time, getting foam rubber was pretty challenging. Injected foam rubber prostheses were were just starting to be used in the film industry at that time. Um, I, I laughed when. 
uh, Chris Packham, what this fellow I mentioned, the producer from England, uh, who did a, a documentary, and his goal was to, for BBC, and we were hoping, you know, that this was going to be a serious treatment, but his goal was to debunk, and so he was looking for the smoking gun, what he thought was obviously a man, and uh, in the first suit, and uh, part of his program showed uh, this gentleman standing in front of the monitor watching the film, and it, it turns out he is a costume designer from Hollywood, and he goes, oh, this is obviously a man suit and here's how we do it and he turns and here's the actor standing here and he's pulling on a spandex undergarment with sewn in uh, tailored sculpted foam rubber musculature and then he puts on the stretch fur outer garment which has see, uh, you know the wrists and gloves that are covered by the long hair six inch long hair on it uh, and a waistband and uh, these floppy artificial feet with divergent big toes, it looked like a gorilla. <laughs> and uh, even this guy, when he got the whole costume on, he looked very pear-shaped, very hippie, narrow shoulders. And then they had the, act, the uh, cameraman run and jiggle the camera and make it a little bit blurry, much blurrier than it needed to be. But when you freeze frame a still from that, put it next to the Patterson film, or even my little kids were watching the TV, Dad, that doesn't look anything like that. <laughs> So the obvious man in first suit is not so obvious. It's, it's like, uh, you know, I've always said, it's easy to say that until you see a man in the first suit inside of the Patterson film. I mean, this was the same thing that Hieronymus and Phil Morris ran into. It took him eight months to reverse engineer what was obviously a Morris costume into something that resembled uh, the, the Patterson film. And then once he was all bulked up and everything, he looked like a Harry Pillsbury doll. <laughs> And his arms are short, you know, and, and he, he artificially, this was always funny, you know, everyone says he, Hieronymus walked like Patty. Well, one of the real giveaways that he's just imitating is he would walk with his palms pointing back and his fingers curled like this. Well, why? Because in the most published frame, the copy that Rene de Hinden had copyrighted, one of the copies, there was a little blemish on the hand in that frame, a little circle. That, that made it look like it was making an okay sign. Everyone talks about sometimes with this really long, funny looking thumb that's on the wrong side of the hand. Well, it's not, it's just nothing. The hand is like this. The back of the hand is facing the camera, even at full back swing. But see, he's trying to imitate it, so he walks like an Egyptian, you know, with his hands pointing the wrong way. Um, so, costume, so we have the, 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 the film site, the costume, and what was the third element we were... Oh, well, then, then, and this is where I really come in, and this is the comparative anatomy. Looking at, um, at, at aspects of the anatomy that are apparent in the film and making comparisons to human and non-human primates. So, for example, there's, a, there's one frame where there's a little irregularity like this in, in, the, in the ground where she was expecting her heel to make contact, you know, just through the... It, you know, unconscious walking, and instead it went down a little further, and she came down with a bit of a jolt. And you can see the ripple of the shock wave go right up her body, and when it hits her breasts, her breasts elevate and flatten from side to side a little bit in, in response to that shock. Well, Bill focused in on that, and he created prosthetic breasts from using every possible combination of materials back then. So water bags are possible and would be most likely to have some evidence of shock. But, to, but and I thought, well, you know, wouldn't that be the most logical? Well, he said, yes, but then to do that with fur cloth, not stretch, four-way stretch, you have to tailor the fabric around that curved breast, that, that prosthetic breast. And he said, and that takes some real sophisticated tailoring to not make obvious seams in the fur and in, in the costume fabric. So he said, that's very unlikely. That's a real difficult, uh, you know, extra work. So what they would more likely do is to mold something out of the various types of rubber. If you use, you know, solid latex rubber, it's quite heavy, but it doesn't have enough, even enough inertia or, or plasticity to have that kind of a shock wave go through it. If you use foam-injected rubber, they're too light, and there's no inertia with the step, and it just, it just you know, never changes shape. 
Uh, so we actually, he hired some models, some professional models, and they're using body paint and everything.